Welcome to the vlog. Returning guest, Chris Hagome. How are you? Great. How are you, Francis? Very good. Very good. So for the listeners, Chris and I started talking, and as we suspected, we started just going down the rabbit hole. We started talking <laughs> about martial arts and, and weapons and all that. And said, so, you know, we got to take a step back and hit record button because, you know, <laughs> we could talk for an hour and a half and run out of time to record. It's, yes. It's amazing having you back. You know, your, your, um, the conversation I had with you was, I mean, you have such a vast experience. I thought it would, it would be very interesting to bring you back and continue talking about many things you've learned and, and that we know about your teaching and your various systems. So thank you so much. I know you've been busy. So all the more reason to be very, very thankful to have you back. Oh, well, thank you, Francis. It's my pleasure, my honor. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. As since, as since we put this on our calendars, I'm like, woohoo, I get to have a, a long chat with Francis and, and uh, that would be, it's going to be great. So I'm Yeah, I feel the same way. When we, um, also for the listeners, when we conversed the last time, it was just like fun and we wanted to keep going and keep going. It's, and of course we have a schedule and we have life and responsibilities. So they you know, they kind of set a, an artificial limit to that, but yeah. we would have gone on for, like we said, for days, right? And then we wake up and say, oh my God, it's been three days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally true. And I mean, even for the next couple of days after, I was like, that was just the best. I had the best time. So yeah. of course, when you asked me to return, I'm like, oh yeah, that provided me energy for days. So that was awesome. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the, the, one of the things about the conversation with you was the richness of your experience of as, as, a, as a practitioner, right? And then today we're gonna to talk more about your aspect as a teacher, but as a practitioner, that richness, because you have allowed yourself to feel curiosity and the desire to learn and explore many things. But I want to ask you directly, right? As you learn various disciplines or systems, what people out there would say various martial arts. Uh -huh. Do you find the ability, when you express yourself, do you find the ability to put them in a box and choose? Or does it just, just make you grow and create a synthesis of it, which is what Chris Jacome's art is? How, how does it express itself and how do you put those things together? Uh, so that's, I mean, that's a fascinating question. So I would say, first and foremost, I learned most of what I do from my primary source of martial arts uh, knowledge has been my Sifu master Heath Cox. And so he, you know, I train in these modalities that he teaches, but he mixes them and all the time. So primarily Kung Fu Sansu, but then Jeet Kune Do uh, and the Filipino martial arts, and then modern Eskrima, uh, and then a lot of different ground fighting work. Um, and so with his kind of holistic approach, I learned all these. So there were, there have been separate, you know, uh, there are separate classes for him, but at the same time, he mixes all of those. And then he tries to do his best to go, well, this is coming from this. This is coming from this. This is coming from this. This is our focus, you know? Um, but today we're going to, even though this is a Kung Fu Sansu class, we are doing modern Eskrima today. Okay. So from pretty much as soon as, you know, I, I started out with uh, Jeet Kune Do. That was my first uh, foray into, as an adult training in martial arts. Um, which in itself is a mixed martial art. And then, uh, then I, I started training from uh, Master Heath Cox. And uh, so with that, uh, you know, I automatically had all this diversity, but then I trained in separate classes and then, you know, went along that, uh, you know, that progression in each of those arts individually but all of them, just like we talked about last time, as an individual, you can't undo stuff. And I'm not gonna, I'm not going to take, I'm not gonna show you something because it's not part of one art when I think it's gonna be very good for you, even if you're training from me in another art. I'm like, I'm gonna pull it, 
pull from any source I can to give you the best information and the best way to explain, the best way to develop you as a practitioner. And I learned that from, from my Sifu, Heath Cox. So, um, and as far as my own expression, I, you know, I am this uh, synthesis of all these inputs, all this training experience. Um, one of the, I can separate them, but that's hard. Like, and it's really good because, you know, I think of it in a, in a cognitive load kind of sense, you know, it's like, okay, so I have to think in this paradigm only and only, only use this information within these walls, even though I have a solution right here that would be easier and my go-to, I, that's not, that's not part of what I'm doing here. So I have to, you know, I have to do this and it's really good for me as a, as a, you know, somebody that, uh, well, as for anybody that's training to have to try to limit yourself and go, okay, you, you know, to, to, uh, really focus what you're working on. And, uh, and it kind of gets harder as you build your own personal language, your own way of communicating through martial arts, it gets more difficult to take away all this stuff because there's, there's more stuff there. Um, so it's great. It's, it's a, I, hopefully I answered your question. Absolutely. It almost feels like by artificially creating those limitations, you're also pushing the skill development in a particular way, right? Absolutely. You're, you're, you, know, you can use it to develop a specific skill um, or a specific way of thought to, to challenge your defaults. You know, we all have things that are go-tos and it's going to be good. Um, you know, sometimes those go-tos are the best, but sometimes your go-to can get you killed. So, right. And from a teaching standpoint, when I visit uh, Crucial Combatives, and by the way, I forgot to mention for the listeners, I put the, I'll put the uh, link to our first conversation where we mentioned uh, in detail your background and what uh, Crucial Combatives is, uh, but basically your school of martial arts and your approach to it. If I was to come to you as a student and say, hey, do you, is Crucial Combat is or your approach to teaching fundamentally the synthesis you've created so that you know what to give the student depending on their skill? Or do you have students to come to you just to learn Sun Tzu or JKD and do you accommodate them? Uh, yes and yes. Yes. Um, so uh, really my, my uh, focus would be to get anybody to a certain level of skill. And so it's a little bit, for me, what I would prefer is a broader approach uh, where I can pull from anything that I want to, if they're a beginner, like if they just come into me out of, you know, out of, out of uh, with no martial arts experience and saying, you know, I, I trust your process. I know, you know, I know what you uh, can create. And so, mold me, you know? So um, with that, I would, I would pull from a bunch of different sources to try to get you to a certain level. And then, then we go from there and go, okay, well, so now you have a smattering. I've done my best to show you where these things come from, which, which route, what, you know, what things do you like? Do you want to go a specific route? Do you want to go through and, and pursue Kung Fu Sansu? Do you want to pursue JKD? you want to pursue combat systema what are you looking to do yeah or do you want to do just the uh, the the synthesis and continue that way that's great too so yeah. you know yeah you know as you're speaking this idea comes to me right now but it is based on a comment you made earlier in fact many of the um, or most of what we call martial arts today or martial arts systems today are that because historically speaking, these modern arts we have today were the result of those syntheses already because those founders or people who influenced the development had most of them multiple influences. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's almost like unavoidable in this particular time of history when we talk about these arts, they normally came from a result of all these. So in other words, the process that you have replicated in your own journey, which is what you become and therefore it, what you can pass on to someone is basically what's happened to the arts and it's a healthy thing. It's the only way that it will 
evolve and grow, right? Continue to evolve and grow. Absolutely. Yeah. And stay and stay alive thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So now we go back to this aspect of teaching. I think, and I'll say this publicly here, I think you're, you are a fantastic martial artist, but Chris, you're above all things, one of the most talented teachers that um, I know, but it's not me. There's like person after person, you know, how many people do I know that speak of your ability to teach? And this is a, a superpower in itself, right? Uh -huh. The ability to make someone better is in itself a very great skill, which is uh, sometimes present in the martial arts, sometimes not. So I want to I wanna dig into that. I have a fascination for the art of learning. How is it that humans learn? I look at it almost like from a, even when you look at kids and they're learning, they're learning language, for example, they're learning coordination of the body and then adults. Uh, and one of the things that, one of the languages that I have uh, learned to use with people so that they think in the right way is the language of music. And lo and behold, I happen to be speaking with a musician and a professional musician and music teacher, which is you, and this is the other part of your life. So in this podcast, we don't want to shy away from that because I think it informs who you are and it gives you the ability to know how to reach people in a way that is very, very uh, unique because you teach music and because you know music. So why don't, why don't we summarize your musical journey for the listeners and then we go into the connections between music, martial arts and teaching and learning. Okay. Wow. All right. <clears throat> um, my summary is a. I mean, wow. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I I started guitar when I was 13 years old, and uh, you know, and anyway, I started with uh, electric guitar quickly. Within you know a few years, I heard flamenco and had a, an electric guitar teacher that played flamenco and uh, introduced me to it, got me listening to it. And then a couple of years from there, I was like, I, I got to do flamenco. That's what I really want to do. Uh, I got a degree in classical guitar performance uh, and then I moved to Sevilla. Um, and so then I, well, I also got a degree in Spanish literature. So classical guitar performance, then I stayed on because I only had a year left to get a degree in Spanish literature. So I, I got two undergrad degrees. And then I moved to Sevilla, Spain and studied flamenco. And I was there about a year the first time and then moved back to the States. And that was uh, in 1999 that I moved back to the US. And, uh, and then from then on, I made my you know, career as, as a professional flamenco guitarist, um, you know, uh, was a part of a couple of uh, flamenco dance companies as the uh, lead guitarist and uh, musical director. And then I created my own uh, dance company. Um, and not that I dance, uh, my wife is a fabulous flamenco dancer. And, uh, and then we've been doing this uh, Hakume Flamenco for uh, you know more than a decade and then uh, all along those lines, I was teaching, but really it was martial arts and Sifu Heathcox uh, for me that those two things, you know, uh, Sifu Heathcox, I mean, just like, I had no idea. Like that individual has had more impact on my life than I think, yeah, other than my, my family, yeah? Um, and I've had some amazing people in my life. I've, I've been blessed beyond belief with the amount of wonderful people that have come into my life. Um, but man, uh, Sifu Heathcox, uh, you know, I, so learning martial arts from him, seeing how he teaches that whole process and how much he cares for his, his students and how much attention and, um, and yeah, just sensitivity towards their needs. And yeah, uh, so that 
uh, art of teaching. I, and then learning, like I learned, I know how to learn so much better because of the way he teaches. He taught me how to learn and, uh, yeah, so unbelievable. And then with, uh, with that, I started noticing when I was giving guitar lessons, which I wasn't doing very much, <clears throat> but I gave a, you know, I had a few students and, uh, and uh, so I started going, wow, uh, this is, I'm getting better as a teacher. I understand how to teach music in a better way um, for me. You know, I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of amazing music teachers out there. And I was a good teacher in that I genuinely cared about my students. You know, I really wanted them to do well. I just didn't have the tools to do it. I didn't know how to break down the information. I didn't know how to uh, create a curriculum. Um, and so all that stuff, really, I, I am the teacher I am because of Master Heath Cox and because of, and martial arts. Wow. I am fascinated with those connections. There's so much in there because, you know, like some people may be surprised, like martial arts and music, what's the connection? But I happen to know so many martial artists that have some sort of musical background, not to your level of expertise and professional development, but many Martial artists have, you know, uh, on the side, they play guitar or they express themselves. And, mm -hmm. and uh, in the case of, uh, for example, my Kung Fu brother, Dan Mankas, is a professional musician and sound engineer. And he studies uh, with me under, under uh, the same teacher. And for him, also those two worlds are very connected. So it shouldn't be that surprising. Martial arts has the word art after all. And exactly. when you do it, you realize because it is a form of expression, right? Now, then you talk about caring about your students, but isn't it true that it is a challenging thing because it's not an intellectual endeavor, right? So sometimes I used to be a teacher too, but I used to be a language teacher. Okay. And so language as in a foreign language. And so in Spain, uh, by the way, we will we will mention here. I was born in Spain, even though I live in New York. And you lived in Spain for some time. That was like going to the heart of the flamenco root. So that, that's really really good. I visited Se Se Sevilla uh, mm -hmm. one year, many years ago. I was very young, and it's fast. It's an incredible place. You know, that's a way you know super beautiful place. So that's very nice. That's really really nice. But as a language teacher, I remember this experience with students in which we were going through the progression, right? And we say something, all right. And then I explain, no, no, because you have to have this, this is the possessive, whatever. And then the students will think about it and say, okay, I understand. And I went like, no, but that the fact that you understand has nothing to do with your learning. Once you've done it, when you've repeated that 10,000 times, then maybe you've learned. The fact that you understood it is just, enough for you to start the repetitions, but until you do those repetitions, you're not learning because that understanding that, that your brain produces isn't what creates fluid communication mm -hmm. at all. And I think music is very similar and martial arts is very similar, even more so. So would you be all right talking a little bit about that as a teacher, what dimension of teaching music? You were very patient with me as a, as a flamenco uh, student, someone who I, I have no talent for that. So that's one of the reasons I know how patient you are and how, how well you've created a system out of something very unapproachable. Flamenco specifically also is very unapproachable, right? I, so tell yes, us, I, I tell think us a little bit about that. How do people learn martial arts and music? Ooh, um, <clears throat> so <laughs> how do they learn it? Um, wow, that's a... a a uh, very complicated question you're asking me. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so what I, you know, I, so primarily I teach guitar. Okay. So I can teach other things in music and I do teach other things in music. And, you know, um, but guitar, in order to play guitar, I, I consistently tell people that you have to remember, especially beginners. So if a beginner guitar student comes to me, so you got to remember that this is a physical endeavor. Yeah. So first things first for me, I just try to get this 
you know, people get a new guitar and they don't know how to hold it. They don't, you know, so there's all these things where it just all feels really weird and awkward. And I'm like, it's going to feel really weird and awkward until it doesn't feel really weird and awkward. And so I go through a series of best practices and really is just trying to get coordination, motor movement. And, you know, it's like in the martial arts world, there's the gross motor movement and the fine motor movement, you know? In guitar, I'm like, it's beyond fine motor movement. It's hyper fine motor movement. We're talking about fractions of millimeters and fractions of ounces of pressure that you get to learn to be sensitive to. Yeah. Um, and so it's a long process and getting to feel like people that, you know, it's like, first of all, you know, your pointer finger is pretty much the only finger you will ever use other than typing to do anything. If you have a, if it's your number one for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's your number one. If something were to happen, if this finger were to fall, then you would go to number two, you know, number three, you're never going to use your pinky. However, your pinky is super important in guitar, yeah? It, so we have to learn to use all of these and how to, how to function with them. And then, you know, so basically I, I give people that, you know, with guitar at least, you know, we just work on the physical act of just moving and, and getting custom to uh, such a, a, a unique experience. It's asking so much of our bodies that has never been asked of before you know? Um, and then, you know, in martial arts, it's the same way. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I, I teach, you know, very small, you, you know, all private classes right now, it's all private classes. And so it's just, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe two people at a time, you know? Um, so I'm right there with the people. I can see what they, you know, what their coordination level is, what challenges they're having, and it's this combination of being able to focus on one specific skill and then going, okay, then add more skills on top of it, or which is stress. And so it's monitoring stress levels, you know, and going, okay, well, we got to dial it back because right now is you're not getting anything out of this. Okay. We got to dial this back and then, and then try to add back on because you, see the big picture of where you're trying to take them. But if we put too much stress on them, they'll, they'll just collapse. Yeah. I'm having a mind blown moment because I never thought of a teacher as a, this art of monitoring the stress levels. If you put too little, if you put too much, it doesn't, that formula doesn't work. And so yes. first you have to be able to read how is the stress level of the student going? Mm -hmm. And then what is the right level to gradually, which is the art to be able to do it gradually. Yeah. That is where the magic happens. Yes. And I find that so fascinating, both in martial arts and music, right? The reason you have incredible musicians other than people who just were born with it and incredible martial artists who go through a training program is because somebody has managed to create a learning process, a, a, a yeah. training program. And invested time, and it's either through the, the yeah, invested a lot of time and en energy and trying to meet and trying to, uh, to work that balance of, of, that, of that stress, yeah? You know, and you're not always going to get it right. Sometimes you overstress them a little too much, you're like, ah, I should, yeah, I got to dial it back, you know? But hopefully it's not uh, hugely stressful where it, it's a collapse, you know? You're just looking to have that, oops, I see a little bit of a, a, you know, a failure going, I gotta, I gotta bring it back, you know? Um, and if you're sensitive to that and, and, and knowing how to do that, then you can attenuate it properly instead of making huge, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, and yeah. if they happen, you know, in, in anything that you, you know, in anything that you're teaching, you know, privately like that, you know, um, people are gonna, they just won't show up. They you know, yeah. So hopefully if you have a massive failure, yeah, if you have a, you know, something where they just kind of implode and they're, you know, it could be emotionally or, you know, or physically, you know, you could really mess up and hurt someone, get somebody hurt. One of your students hurt in martial arts, you know, 
accidents happen, hopefully it wasn't a negligent, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, pro, a factor of negligence, you know, of overt negligence, you know, on your part. Um, but, uh, you know, then they just won't show up. You won't get another opportunity, you know? So it's working on that little, little factors here and going, okay, good, good, good. And then just the, the for me, and I'm, I'm pulling from a bunch of different sources, but um, we need that stress to grow. But at the same time, I, for some reason, I seem to remember somewhere up here learning that uh, stress, when you, the things that you learn when you're under high stress and under a stress level, they, they get embedded faster and deeper. And so if you learn the wrong things, if you learn the wrong things in the wrong way, oh, then you have to, it takes much longer to undo that. Oh, so you get somebody that's shutting down for, you know, in martial arts, you're going too hard and they're shutting down and they're cowering like this, you know? Well, it's going to be really hard to undo that flinch response of just backing up and stuff, you know, yeah. and cover it up and just, you know, going into lockdown you know that freeze response yeah um so we you know as a martial artist that's one real good visual cue you know as soon as people start going like that it's done you gotta <laughs> stop yeah yeah so so anyway. interesting so much of it i remember uh when i was studying music so much of it is the same because when when someone starts trying to play the guitar by themselves they acquire a lot of bad habits too and it has to be overcome. So much of it is turning that into the right body mechanics by virtue of discipline and the training program. You had a video, fascinating. I was trying to learn the triplets. Okay, create, the abanico, the abanico. To create the rhythm mm -hmm. uh, from abanico. Yeah. And you, in that video, people watching that video won't even uh, know that you do martial arts, right? And you said, the secret of this is the correct body mechanics. Body mechanics. Body mechanics is the word we use in our discipline in martial arts, but the correct yes. body mechanics. Now, as you say, in your music is, is hyper fine motor skills, right? So it is a little different, but fundamentally, a lot of the similar things are happening. And, and I see a great connection here in that we use body mechanics to create to fine tune the machine to express itself. But once it does it, it's doing something greater than the body mechanics. Both in music and in martial arts, it's important to have the correct body because otherwise it's not gonna work. But, <laughs> but the goal is beyond that. It's something that the student is not gonna be able to experience until they master the body mechanics. But, it's, but you're expressing something way higher, which in this case would be music, mm -hmm. musical feeling and emotion. Or in the case of martial arts, it could be a real situation, the ability to react without thinking, or maybe even self-expression. But it is similar. The body mechanics is not the end, but it is a necessary track. And I find that connection between those two worlds. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the body mechanics, and you know, it's a lot easier as a as an instrumentalist, but even as a vocalist, oh, yeah. you know, it is body mechanics. It's just it's muscles you can only feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're still learning body mechanics of how your your vocal cords and all the musculature in your mouth and all that stuff affects what you do, you know. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, the body mechanics, we have to learn how to get our hands to make certain sounds at certain times. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, it all has to be coordinated, you know. Yeah, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. Yeah, so I see all those all those connections in the sense that, you know, if I was to memorize a chapter of a history book and recite it tomorrow, that type of learning has nothing to do with what we're trying to do here or, or very little, right? Yeah. It's, it's an entire reprogramming of how do you express yourself, right? And so I, I actually find that very, very useful. Um, so many people that I know of, in martial arts understand music to a certain extent and mm -hmm. and it's become for me a common thing to just use that language the language of that metaphor yeah 
Yeah, that metaphor. For example, here's, here's one I do all the time. You know the famous thing in martial arts, people that are not really, uh, people that are a little critical when we have a drill and they say, oh, that would never work in a fight. And so I always go back to the practicing scales in music. That's not a song, but it builds the skill and it's, everyone gets it the moment I say that. You can never go to a musician and say, never do a scale. <laughs> Very similar things that are exercises that build the skill. Yeah. And then there is the expression of that in a song. Exactly. Yep. It's, it is. I mean, uh, any of these, uh, well, not any, but, you know, music and martial arts absolutely are linked uh, in a way. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but for me, one of the most fascinating parallels between martial arts and music is timing. Right. Wow. So, uh, the, you know, I, I, I remember Henner Gracie says this a lot, said, you know, the, the right technique at the wrong time is the wrong technique, you know? So you can play the most beautiful note. You can play like, I love, you just pick a letter. I love D, you know? But if you're in the key of E flat, that that D might not work. Or if that, you know, if you're in the key of, yeah, if you're in the key of uh, whatever, there's so many keys that, that wouldn't work. Or even in the key of D, that that D might not be the best choice for that one moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's about playing the right notes, but you have to play them at the right time. Yeah. If you're, you can play the right notes, but if they're not at the right time, it, they, they don't work. Yeah. Yeah. And then I love that idea of, you know, uh, you know, everybody has a puncher's chance. You don't have to train martial arts to have a puncher's chance. You know, you throw something out there, it can land. Yeah. And so it's easier on, I, I don't mean to demean the piano in any way, but it's easier for anybody to walk up and hit a piano there's a less uh and uh, barrier to entry just mm -hmm. go you know anybody can hit a piano key whereas in guitar you could hit an open string but in order to fret you have to fret the right string and the right have your finger in the right place in the fret and then pick it or whatever so there's more a little bit bigger barrier to entry for guitar in that sense but you know you can you can have that perfect timing and just go up there and hit that right note at the right time in the song and just out of luck is just an amazing note you mm -hmm. know and then another person who's a gifted musician on the piano is like and and it's like well i don't really that doesn't do anything for me i'd rather hear that one note at that one time you know yeah, yeah. So there's all this, you know, all this parallel there with the complexity and people getting lost in the complexity. And it's really good to train the complexity, but ultimately it's about uh, what do you, you know, discarding, discarding, and then being able to know, have all these options available to you and choose the best option at that best time. Yeah. I hadn't thought of the connection with timing, to be honest. That is incredible because both disciplines, they simply won't work without the right timing. It just is, is integral to it. And it's built into our drills and it's built into our practice. Without the right timing, nothing happens, right? You use metronome for your students in music? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's essential, essential. It's essential. It's essential. Yeah. I, I tell people that's, so yeah. Uh, you know, I could go on all about this, of course, in any direction for any of this stuff, but the, you know, the metronome is essential. Like that is, I tell anybody, if you're, if you're serious about being a musician, there is no serious musician that does not use a metronome. Yeah. There isn't one. There isn't one. There you go. Well said. There is not one. So that's it, you know, and, and until you, until you get to the point where you like using a metronome, you're not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Until you get to the point where you're like, I'm, I wouldn't practice without it. And that seems insane to practice without a metronome. Who would do that? There's a lot of people and they're not very good. And that's why nobody hears of them. There's millions, thousands, I don't know, millions, <laughs> thousands of people. Yes. Yeah. 
So you have to practice with a metronome or if, or a metronome substitute, meaning, yes. you, know, uh, you know, there's apps now, there's apps apps on your phone, thing, yeah. but you know, a drummer, you know, people that were, you know, playing bands, then they have a drummer and that's their metronome. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so anyway, but that, yeah. So then the other parallel timing wise, or it's actually not even timing wise. It, it does have to do with timing. Um, but I love this, this uh, phrase from Kevin Secor that he says, uh, you want to develop in, in martial application. Um, so he's the founder of Combat Sistema. Um, but he, he says uh, you want to develop what call, he calls the reflex of continuance. Oh, wow. So your reflex should be, should be to continue. You're gonna, you understand that, that violence, interpersonal combat is chaos. Everything's not gonna go the way you think it's gonna go, but your reflex should be to keep on going, to continue. It just, you just keep on going. So that's kind of like, if we look at it in the, in the new age paradigm, that's like the power of now, you gotta stay in the moment. Yeah. So what I love about this performance concept and that's really what it is. If we take performance into the music and we go, when you're playing live, when you're actually in, in it and you're performing and it's going, you're going to mess up. And you have to have that reflex of continuance. You have to stay where you are now, because if you hold, if you uh, start judging and thinking about what you could have done or that I messed up, you're not thinking of what's going to happen and you're going to, things are gonna spiral, gonna have uh, quickly diminishing returns for you. And it happens all the time in music. That's what I you train my students to work on. Right. And because they want to start over. You wanna start over. You can't do that. Oh, wait, 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 I, I didn't do that right. I wanna start, can we start again? Well, yeah. there's a, you know, there's a time for that, of course. Yeah. But there are certain, certain modalities where you have to, train your brain to just keep on going i messed up i keep on going i go 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 yeah. go go and that has to happen in in music and in martial arts and, and in martial arts is, performance i i love all it is so insightful so in martial <laughs> arts when we it's it's absolutely essential to our training like you go with an idea and the entire point is to let go of the idea the moment that it fails. And it will fail 99% of the time. You go with the idea of this punch, it gets pushed, it gets, it fails. Mm -hmm. And so the entire practice is to, it doesn't matter. I adapt and I don't know to what until it's happening. This now that you're talking about, to be honest, one of the most beautiful things to me of the martial arts practice is mm -hmm. that, is that the way it forces me to be in the now. Absolutely. I think a lot of, I think a lot of the people that are uh, lifetime practitioners, I mean, that's one of the primary uh, motivators behind why we continue to do it is because it, it really brings us to the now and, and that, you know, it's yeah. like, it's really hard to think of anything else when a punch is coming at your face. Yeah. You I'm going to just say this because it's going to be a, a light note, but so not what Robert Downey Jr. did in Sherlock Holmes, the guy plots his entire fight, said, I'm going to hit him there. I don't know if you remember that movie. It was a great oh, yeah. movie otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And I love the character of Sherlock Holmes, by the way. Yeah, oh, I My wife you. and I, we love the Jeremy Brad Sherlock Holmes of the uh, 80s. Oh, uh, okay. TV. But this, this Robert Downey Jr., and he did a good accent and all that. But, and, you know, everyone knows he's doing some Wing Chun and all that. But... He blots his thing and says, I'm going to hit him there. The guy obviously is going to move his hand that way. Then I'm going to, and in many of the fights, he goes exactly like, he, like, like, and it's the martial arts is really the opposite. Like even one second before it happens, I could not predict how it's going to go. It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. Even in the drills we do, let alone in, 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 a, in a, in a complete chaotic situation, like what people like to call a fight. Yeah. It's impossible. And that's the beauty of it that we're trying to, <laughs> adapt and keep going you said continuity we're trying to just keep going and mm -hmm. that is amazing and, and i never thought of the connection with live performance mm -hmm. you know when you you have a lot of those live performances you must be unnerving 
yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, there's a bunch of different factors as to nerve level and, you know, uh, so sometimes you're not, you're hardly nervous at all. Sometimes you're very nervous, you know, um, yeah. so there's a bunch of different factors that go into that. And, you know, that's one blessing of, of uh, doing what I do for a living is that I have got lots of opportunities at that. Yeah. So I'm pretty good at reading myself and pretty good at that reflex of continuance. Yeah. Yeah. Just doing it. It, do, it doesn't matter. It does, I mean, the nerve level is going to be what it's going to be. I, it doesn't matter. I still got to do what I got to do. Yeah. So, and if you take a little, little mistake and you make a big deal out of it, then the audience will notice a lot more. But if you just keep going, yep. you know, because it is, it is something that's being created right there. Right yeah. Now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember we, we'll honor here the great master Paco de Lucia, <laughs> a great, great master of one of my favorite musicians of all times. Absolutely, uh, and he he said uh, there was a case. I, I this is many years ago that I the, he did a concert, and this guy grew up doing this, right? Yes, this is, he breathed and he, and so they asked him, oh, you know, like amazing concert. Everybody loved it. People were blown away, and they asked him. He was like, man, it was horrible. The 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 place um, resonance was horrible. The strings were in right. My nails were in the right. He found a million, but the guy played. Nobody noticed a thing, and it was the, one of the most influential concerts for a lot of people. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> if he let that bother him. Yeah, it would yeah. have been a disaster. But he had that 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 continuity, right? Well, and then also, I, I mean, I really think, and this is why we train. You know, like he fell to the level of his training, which is unbelievable. He has a lifetime, a lifetime. of of work under him. So his worst day is better than 99.9999999% of all the musicians that have ever lived. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I, so he, I, you know, he had his terrible day was like completely way better than anybody could ever dream of. Yeah. And that's yeah. just the power of practice. You yeah. say, well, talent, and it is difficult to measure that. You must notice that when you start teaching someone, some people, have a talent to start learning faster. Mm -hmm. But if you fast forward 10 years, I think it's indistinguishable whoever had talent from whoever just continued working. Yeah. I think you only notice that at the beginning to say how quickly do they pick it up. Mm -hmm. But that is so small in the big picture of what's gonna happen many years later. Absolutely. And we, we love to compartmentalize, you know, and it makes things easier. It's important to be able to compartmentalize, but then recognizing that we're a part of a much bigger thing. So the, the student we see in front of us, that's not their life, you know, it's just one facet of their life. And there's so many other life factors that, that have to do with their success and their continuance, you know, so they can be super talented. And they can learn really quickly, you know, because of their, the attributes that they bring to the table, but other things in their life can totally derail everything. Exactly. They can be the most motivated and dedicated person and other life factors can completely derail them. Yeah. I'm a big believer of that. When you see someone who's done something for many, many years and they're doing very well, talent is a very, very small part of it because talent didn't get them there. Yeah. It was dedication, hard work and not giving up. Right. But but it is true that talent can have an impact. I'm not completely discounting talent. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But in continuing, the, you know, like 10 years later, the guy who just didn't have talent but is continuing working is, yeah. is up there. Right. Because I, you know, I, I would say like, uh, so that's how you get the popular Lucias. That's how you get the Michael Jordans. You know, you get these extreme cases of, you know, uh, of high highest level, uh, you know, uh, skills. And I, it's because they came to the table, they had a, a natural, some natural talent, but then they had that amazing work ethic and that dedication and uh, perseverance. And they also had other uh, environmental factors that, that helped them, yeah. So, you know, with Paco de Lucia, I mean, he was born in Algeciras, you know, I mean, you know, Family, he came from a flamenco. His, 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 his uh, parents had the best flamencos 
in in that area always come to their house like you know every other night so he was surrounded by the art that he was to go and, and exactly. make his life from I mean he that's how he grew up like going to sleep you know falling asleep before everybody else as a kid and he'd be hearing the best you know the historical figures in flamenco incredible that's what he's hearing as he's going to sleep you know he's got, exactly he said something one day that gave me goosebumps which is before I ever held the guitar in my life, I already knew perfectly all the palos yeah. because he grew up with them. And even that is something that is very hard to learn if you didn't grow up with it. Exactly. How the, the beats. Yeah. The, the, very the accent beats. structure, how the cante goes over and where the melismas are and all that. I mean, oh man, yeah. Yeah, and this guy just is what he grew up with. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then, you know, his father, his older brother were guitarists. I mean, so there's all that factor. I don't know Nero as much of, of Michael Jordan, but, you know, of course, uh, I, I have no doubt that he had, uh, yeah. you know, a, 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 a decent amount of talent. But then I know, I do know that he had an amazing work ethic. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then there's just certain things, you know, people have advocates and it might not even be family you know, that is their support system, but they have some kind of outside advocacy that helps, you know, coach them or helps, yeah. you know, bring them along, you know, and go, oh, here, you like this? Let me feed you more of what, what this is. And they, but it is, there's this like um, uh, serendipitous, they can be very serendipitous where this right person comes along at the right time and yeah. goes, here you go. Um, you know, so it's it's really fascinating all that stuff. You know, and for I, me, yeah. for me, I really feel like it was, you know, my Sifu Heath Cox. Like he just came along at the right time for me, and I'm like, holy moly! I had no idea. I had no. That's idea. what happened. That's, that's what happened to me. That's how I felt with my. Teacher. That this that this would you know that you existed that there was you know this person that would you know take so much time and effort and and uh, and, and open up a new world. To you and just just completely so you know just open up this new world open up this new world of you know and then how to convey information and and you know how to catalog things and recognize things uh, i mean unbelievable unbelievable just uh completely paradigm shifting yeah and life-changing for me and life-changing for me for, for you absolutely that's what happened to me and I'm, as you express yourself that way i feel very connected to the experience i had with my teacher george incredible like that you know i i'm going to uh, to continue this this uh, comparison just maybe a little bit more and then we'll we'll switch to another quick topic that i have for you i'm going to challenge you this is going to be a challenging question for you and you for already me. challenged me we're, we're taking it for, off a notch okay yeah Please this too. is hey you're a martial artist <laughs> this is going to be a fun one i don't even know as i'm going to ask you if, if we can answer it but but it is a good um, I think we will. It is a good um, mindset for the martial artist. So that's why I'm going to ask the question. Okay. In music, there's all these parallels with the actual art of learning martial arts, learning music. But one thing that happens in music that is admirable is that when you have a student, a new student, someone comes to you with a Spanish guitar, uh -huh. you know, $30 of the market, Simple and say, hey, normally, even if they don't know how to verbalize it, you are understanding their goals. You say, hey, look, if one day in a birthday party with my family, I can play a song that they enjoy, I have considered this class as successful. Uh -huh. And if that happens, and in other words, it's hard for them to lie to themselves because they'll know when they can play that song. Yeah. I have this loving criticism of the martial arts. I say loving because I love martial arts so much. <laughs> but I think we need to learn to give ourselves ways in which we can honestly determine are we progressing or not instead of living in a bubble of fantasy. Okay. Which is a problem that you don't have in music. If I've been, if you see me in music, it's a, how, Francis, how long have you been playing the, the guitar? So, 30 years, play me something. And I play a scale. I have no idea how to play a song. So it's, something has happened here. <laughs> was your goal to do scales? And probably it's because that's not music, right? Uh -huh. What is the equivalent of that objectivity 
in the martial arts. You see what I mean? How do I know as a student of yours for 10 years that my that this is quote unquote working and I don't want to limit what working means. It could yeah. mean a million things, right? But how do I establish an objective way to determine that and thus challenge myself to progress objectively? Mm. Uh, okay, so with music, unfortunately, so well, so we're dealing with this factor of time and then of, uh, yeah, time, your available time, how committed you are, and, uh, and then attributes, you know, how, what do you come to the table with, you know, and if you, you might pick a song, like, this is my dream song, and even at 20, you're, you're 20 years old, I just got my guitar, this is my dream song, I want to be able to play this, um, and unfortunately, your attribute level is so low that, like, 30 years, we'll see. Yeah, good point. We'll see. Yeah, and you're gonna have to work really hard. Good point. There's other people that would go, yeah, that song, yeah, one year, we're good. Yeah, there's other, there's people that are just, it's gonna take 30 years of hard work to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just the way it goes. Um, so uh, there's that, you know, that factor. Um, and then with martial arts, it gets really tricky in mm -hmm. that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of martial arts and, you know, the stuff that I'm focused on is more self-defense, you know? Um, so personal protection, it's like, well, how do you prove that? Mm -hmm. You know? So that's gets really, really tricky and something that works just because it works one time, like you actually have an, an encounter and this, this such and such, I did this and it worked. There's no guarantee that's going to work ever again. Mm -hmm. yeah so but there are objective truths you know yes. there are certain things that we can go well you know turning your back and you know and saying you know here slit my throat that's probably not going to work you know i don't know yeah. you know um so there there are objective truths but the that's such a slippery thing and that's why why uh people that teach self-defense and, and train in self-defense, that's tricky. And it, it's a tricky thing as a student and as a teacher. Yeah. Because you can't give exact answers. We can train at it and point, we can have these objective truths and pointing at it. Um, and then, but at the same time, we have to always give that disclaimer that it, yes, there has the, to right be. the right technique at the wrong time is the wrong technique. Yeah. yeah? And there's a whole bunch of other what ifs. There's a whole bunch of other yeah. uh, uh, environmental and timing factors and all these things that cannot you cannot predict. Yeah. So um, anyway, but then within competitive martial arts, then you can go, okay, well, I won this competition. I won such and such competition against certain, you know, within these rules. And I got cool. That's awesome. You yeah. know? Um, and so that gives you a little bit of that uh, objective. There you go. Objective truth. Yeah. The, the dilemma of someone who wants to train for reality or self-defense is yeah. much bigger, but doesn't mean it's unsurmountable, as you said. No. And in that sense, I kind of admire, I, I'm not focused on combat sport. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my art doesn't even have, I can't even do it. But yeah. I kind of, I've learned over the years to kind of admire them in the sense that it's, they, they live in a very objective world. You want, you, you know, a fight there means something specific. Whereas in the yeah. street, a street fight, that could be a million things. Exactly. But if you have a, a fight there, for example, I'm going to give the most, boxing yeah i mean right now we have the the tokyo olympic uh games right so boxing mm -hmm. in the olympic games means something different than professional boxing in the united states yes. it's well defined uh-huh you have three rounds and this is allowed and if you do mm -hmm. too much of a clinch the guy's going to separate you yeah. in the context of that you can test yourself and say how do i know i'm getting better 
because when you first started, uh, 10 fights out of, you've lost nine fights out of 10, and now you win most of them, you know, like whatever, it's a way. Yeah. However, yeah. in the past, this made me demotivated with my choice of martial arts because I was like, I can never experience it. I can never test it. But you know, how do the Navy SEALs train? How do the soldiers train? They've managed to train for reality in a way that reality is not happening. And the fact that we say, well, it can never be trained is not true because then we wouldn't have a professional military in this exactly. country. And so, yeah, like you say, you replicate that chaos and you replicate that situation. And with the disclaimer of who knows what's gonna happen, but you train it and you train in that random. And so it is entirely doable. I just think, I guess the underlying message for me is to challenge each martial artist in their own context, with their own goals, to seek that. So that if you have a way to test it, objective, people call that pressure testing, but I think that's, that's just one way. Yeah. Just put yourself in a situation which you can experience that objectively and losing is actually very healthy because yeah. then you have references to overcome and continue going. Yeah. I, I think the martial arts in general need that, need that aspect. And I, many teachers now do it. It's by no means, uh, it's not a reality that martial arts don't do this, but it used to be very common. I think more uh, earlier on that martial arts had lost that aspect because they were cushioned because there was no competition to martial arts. And so they, kind of forgot to really put the pressure on it, but it's yeah. come back now because of oh, the yeah. pressure of, yeah. of, maybe because of the pressure of combat sports or something. Yep. You know? but, and yeah, it is I healthy. Think I think it's very healthy. We should be pressure tested and we should replicate that. Same thing that you would do with music, right? Absolutely. It's, it's very different, you know, and like, you know, so I, <laughs> with my students, so, you know, I've really made a, a pretty, uh, 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 big jump into teaching over the last two years with the pandemic and all that stuff. And um, so I teach a lot more music now, more music now than I ever have in my entire life, but it's, it's been wonderful. And I see it in a completely different way now because of my martial arts training and because of my C4 Heath right. Cox. And, you know, it's like, uh, I just, I really find joy in, in the whole process and in the process of me trying to figure out how best to, explain a certain topic and you know what oh I explained it this way a couple months ago I like I really like this way this month I really you know like this way of getting that information across how is that going to come across how's that how are you know how are people responding to that um so it helps me learn and reframe and and you know it's like I'm, I'm starting to geek out on that how I process the information how I learn and how other people learn and how to get things across you know um, and, uh, yeah, I never had that before. I always enjoyed teaching. I always enjoyed doing my best for students, but I didn't know what I was doing. Like as far as teaching, right. I, and I was always considered a good teacher. I think I was a good teacher, but just because I cared, you know, exactly. and yeah. I had, I had knowledge to share and I was able to get it across, but now it's a whole different world. Like, yeah. you know, my ability to be able to share and-, and Exactly. You've experienced, you've developed that through your teaching. And to me, that's the fascination. There is an entire world there. I, mm -hmm. because I come from that background, right? Even my university degree was on teaching. And okay. so, you know, when people talk about Rory Miller, for example, yeah. and everybody considers him the expert on reality-based or, but I don't, I consider him an expert on the art of teaching and learning. He studied the human mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. Many things you tell me about that connection, of what is that process, remind me of his writings, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's someone, wait a minute, you know, I was doing judo, these people learned it in six months, these people learned it in two years, what happened here? What is it? What is it? Are they playing more? Do they have more freedom? Do they have less freedom? What is it? How, that, those are the, those are the, and we haven't solved that problem. I think it's no. a fascinating thing that as an individual teacher, you get to play with that. Yeah. Yes. And it's dynamic and it, it fluctuates and, you know, certain people, you know, certain people's moods change and, you know, like just that day, that every individual is an individual, you know? And so then you have the class dynamics and then the individual dynamics that bring, they bring to the class and all that stuff. So 
it's really, it's a fascinating journey. So as, uh, and with me, as far as uh, teaching, I, I was going somewhere and I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, oh man. Don't, no so worries. I, because I uh, think, don't worry. The, the, the teaching aspect and, and how people yeah. process was, was one of the, my biggest points. But yeah. in the time, do you mind if I ask you now a question about one of your particular systems? Sure. So look, I know you have JKD and Screema. I think we're going to have you come again and again and focus on one of them and go into depth. I was planning to do this today, but we're kind of running out of time. But I will just say <laughs> one thing. Yes, sir. Let's just focus on uh, Sansu, Kung Fu yeah. Sansu. Um, and we'll probably have another day to go deeper into it. But if I was just to ask you, what are three important principles in the practice of Sansu? What are three important principles in the practice of Kung Fu Sansu? Uh, the thing that came to mind, uh, and this is, uh, yeah, posture, position, and manipulation. Mm -hmm. Wow. So posture has to do with your proper own individual biomechanics. Mm -hmm. Position would have to do, be in relative and orientation to the, uh, the, the subject in which you're planning to manipulate. So if any of the previous two are off, then that drastically affects number three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in order to maximize your manipulation of an individual, you have to have your own body structure in a line, proper, properly in a line. Yeah. And then you have to be in the proper position to implement whatever, you know, if it's a kick or a punch or an elbow, a mauling, whatever it is, you have to be in the position to do that and in the right uh, posture. And then you, then you would maximize your ability to manipulate. Interesting. So you, when you, when it's, that's very interesting. When a student learns from the beginning with you uh, in this system, they probably focus a lot on on what is correct, because the student of martial arts that comes new, they probably don't understand how to judge if posture is correct, for example. Does mm. it have stability or does it have leverage or things like that? Mm -hmm. And then position probably means also timing because then you would have to maybe close the gap and be in relation to someone else at the right time, right? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So the idea of timing that you were, that you were discussing earlier is probably going to then show up bound to these concepts, probably position and manipulation. Absolutely, that's an overarching principle, that timing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and does Sansu have weapons at some point of the curriculum? So Sansu, yeah, Kung Fu Sansu had traditional weapon work. Uh, my uh, Sifu Heathcox, kind of went with the, the screamer route. So oh. really focusing on uh, on uh, impact weapons and, and edge weapons. So just mm -hmm. making that switch uh, felt that that was gonna be more, uh, more conducive to an overall, uh, creating an overall uh, martial artist is taking that kind of curriculum and putting that in with Sansu. Mm -hmm. For the listeners, does that mean, for example, the the two Kali sticks or the knives, the two knives? Yeah, either either Kali sticks or yeah, edge weapon of, of some sort. Yeah. Of some sort. And, yeah. And so it could be a spada y daga, like the you know, uh, uh, the stick and knife, or it could be two double sticks or just you know, double knives or one knife, single knife, or whatever. But it really also helped address <clears throat> couple of different footwork um, and uh, angling that is pr is present in Sansu. Uh, but in traditional Sansu, it can be a little bit more uh, rigid as opposed to that fluidity yeah. of the Filipino Kali and, and uh, Eskrima stuff. Yeah. The Eskrima and Filipino arts must have a tremendous level of adaptability because 
they so almost always complement certain other martial arts. Like so many JKD people do Eskrima. Mm -hmm. And um, now I see that also in Sansu, there is as a compliment. So like, this is an art that plays very well with other arts. And honestly, you know, as I, as I've matured as a martial artist, like I think they all complement each other. Like there's only so many ways that a human body moves and there's only so many things that can happen that actually work, you know? And so if you take something that works and put it together with something else that works, you know, it's gonna work. It work. <laughs> yeah, it works, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, and then just with that ability to, um, once you, you know, I, you know, I highly encourage people to stay on one track, you know, so I had the best of a bunch of stuff, you know, I had this amazing Sifu, and then he had these three primary arts that he taught, he was combining all three of them a lot of time, and he still does, I still train from him twice a week, I train from him more if I could, um, yeah, so I'm at his house like 12, I'm at his house probably uh, almost 15 hours a week. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so um, yeah. uh, so Sifu, he's Cox, I, like he, he's, you know, I went, I went through, um, you know, I continue, like I just keep on showing up. I'm not going to stop showing up and, you know, I don't even, yeah. So anyway, but. I feel uh, the same you know, way. I understand you completely. I, I've gone, you know, gotten to you know uh, i got my master rank in, in kung fu sansu from mm -hmm. uh, master heath cox and and uh and then you know got these instructorships full instructor on, of jkd and the filipino martial arts and then of modern his modern eskrima concepts um so i went through each individual track but also always with that idea of looking at all of them complementing each other yeah, yeah? Um, and, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, I also where think I that it so I, uh, go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. I also think that really helped me in looking at, at just any martial yeah. technology, like his open-mindedness. It wasn't like, oh, well they do it wrong or they do it this, you know, it was just like, oh, well that, that's different. That's cool. Well, I haven't thought about that. How does that work with what I do? How does that what can I do there? What do we do? Yeah. Ooh, that's fascinating. So it's, it's really, uh, because of being his student, I have this incredible thirst and curiosity and just fascination with yeah. these other modalities and other systems. Yeah. The, the more, I think when a martial artist gets to this point, I'm not sure if we, one can draw a line, but there is a point in training which the art becomes very, very real for you. And after that, I think whenever you get exposed to a, another martial art or something, you start seeing more similarities and differences. Mm. Something happens that when, when a martial art has touched you deeply and you start understanding, almost like you start realizing it's not what you thought it was. It, it's a way deeper thing. Yeah. Then when you see other arts, you start, I don't think it's so, the mind dwells on differences because they're very insignificant. It's more about, like you said, it's a technology, but in different contexts, it expresses itself in different ways. And it has yeah. maybe, you know, uh, slight differences that complement each other. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree that, uh, yeah, you start, it is a weird part where it becomes part of you and you're like, oh, it's not really what I thought yes. it is. And, you know, um, yeah, and it becomes like, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm a Kung Fu Sansu. That's, that's my primary, like, you know, that's my spine, you mm -hmm. know, uh, of my, uh, warrior anatomy, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there, I have these other things that have helped, uh, you know, help me along the way. And, and certainly part of, part of who I am. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's just fascinating how that works. And I, I see it all like, you know, our saying all the time is like, everything is, everything's Kung Fu Sansu, you know, it's like, exactly. you know, that's, that's how we just look at it. You know, when you're like, at that point, that's exactly the experience. Yeah. 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 That, that's what happens. Uh, I'll make this quick comment and I know you have to go to have a class, but you know, the, like in the past, I would have been in a situation 
And maybe because the, the, the dynamics are weird or different and someone says, well, you know, do this other type of punch or something. And in the past, we would have said, well, but that's from boxing, not from Wing Chun. Today, the attitude is like, sure, yeah. No, but wait a minute, that's not Wing Chun. What do you mean that's not Wing Chun? That's like saying that when I walk, that's not the result of my practice. It, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's like if a gymnastics jumps in, in the Olympics and something said, well, but wait a minute, that's different. No, I, I can jump because I train for it. it, it there's no yeah. longer any catalog it's not a catalog it's an expression of skill right yeah yeah bueno señor un placer <laughs> igualmente igualmente primo it, it's been fantastic having you i i knew we we're going to the rabbit hole with the learning and the the, the way because you're really the you know the, the the greatest example i know of that someone who really knows how to teach and oh, so we'll awesome. try to get you back maybe talk about jkd um, and more about Sun Tzu, because I know we barely uh, scratched the surface. But very thankful, and um, and uh, hopefully we can talk again. Thank you very much. I, I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Have a good one. Okay, bye-bye.